Hello class, this is a recorded lecture for ornithology. We're going to continue to talk about migration. We're going to discuss circanual rhythms in the part that it plays in migration. And so birds exhibit uh, oscillation of migration uh, that goes full circle over the course of 12 months. So over the course of a year, migratory birds will go full cycle from leaving their non-breeding grounds or their wintering grounds in the northern hemisphere to move north or species in the southern that breed in the southern hemisphere will move south during the spring migration and so here in the united states uh, we see and are seeing lots of neotropical migrants that have that are moving and have migrated north to breed uh, at the end of the breeding season in fall they will uh, these migrants will fly back south to their non-breeding grounds or their wintering grounds. Uh, and then when uh, late winter, early spring next year, they will start the cycle all over again. So they'll complete this full circle cycle over the course of one year. Circannual means uh, about 12 months. Circa meaning about or approximately. Uh, annual, 12 months or one year. So about one year uh, in rhythm. Uh, and this could be anything, and for birds, we're talking about migratory behavior. They exhibit a circannual rhythm of migratory behavior. Uh, and one interesting feature that we've discussed before, phenomena that birds exhibit, migratory birds exhibit during migration, is something called zugenrui that we've uh, uh, coined once we discovered keeping migratory birds in captivity, they become very restless at night. And this was coined... Um, uh, the phrase coined to this was zugenrui, or migratory restlessness. Uh, and so if you keep a migratory bird in a cage during the breeding season or over winter, it doesn't exhibit this, only during the small win windows uh, twice a year, spring migration or fall migration. Uh, and it will show this restlessness during night, and it's because most birds migrate at night. Uh, and they, if you put them in a funnel, they will jump towards a particular direction in the funnel that co that coincides with the direction in which they're trying to migrate. Um, we used to do this with paper funnels and ink pads. Now we're, we do it a little bit more sophisticated with motion sensors and record this information digitally. Um, and so this is a very interesting circannual rhythm that we see in migratory birds. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, a particular experiment that was done in 2004, uh, taking a look at um, circannual rhythm, uh, migratory behaviors in birds. This one was done in white-crowned sparrows that you can see pictured here. Uh, and in this experiment, uh, they recorded uh, migratory sleep sleepiness. Uh, so one question was, uh, posed well if we have birds that are diurnal they act they're active during the day singing finding food foraging um, and they're also migrating at night during the migratory season uh, does this mean that they're sleeping less during uh, during the day or i'm sorry during, uh, sleeping less uh, throughout a 24-hour period and so uh, this was done about 20 years ago using um, basically miniature uh, computer chips that were able to measure the EEG of uh, a bird's brain's activity. And so EEG stands for electroencephalograph or encephal encephalography. And so this is something that essentially measures, um, I'll, I'll say brain waves, uh, is sort of the the layman sort of way to say that most people sort of um, kind of ambiguously understand uh, what brain waves are, but what it technically is doing uh, is that it is detecting um, uh, differences in electrical potentials in the brain within a certain area, uh, and each neuron. Uh, creates its own electrical potential, and that potential changes dramatically depending on whether or not the neuron is at rest or if it's firing an action potential. 
And so if you sort of get a snapshot of, of a part of the brain, um, it'll sort of tell you what kind of activity is going on. Uh, namely, are the action potentials sort of kind of randomly firing sort of independently of each other, so everything's kind of out of sync? Um, if this is the case, you usually see really short waves, really short fluctuations in the, in the um, electrical potential of that population of neurons. This is characteristic of an awake animal where the brain is very active and so neurons are firing sort of independent of other neurons, even ones that are right next to it. Um, and this is a conscious brain. Uh, but when we sleep, something interesting happens. Neurons, local areas of neurons in the brain, um, the, the brain in general sort of goes through a period of not being as active. Uh, which isn't a surprise if the organism is not conscious. And these neurons, instead of sort of being chatty and active, they start getting in sync with each other, and they all start firing at once. So what you end up seeing are these really slow but really big waves. Um, so the potentials are fluctuating um, to a higher degree because they're all in sync. So this, they essentially become more positive or more negative, this area of neurons. Um, and so we can look at that and we can say like, oh, what do the waves look like with this EEG? And you can infer if this organism is, is asleep, unconscious, or if the organism is conscious and awake and has high brain activity. Uh, so a pretty relatively sort of simple way to measure the brain. Um, um, but it can give you insights into general uh, consciousness and whether or not an organism is asleep or awake. Oh, and there's the name, right? Electroencephalography. So let's take a look at the results here. This is from the paper itself. Um, and so what we're looking at here, if you take a look at the x-axis, we're looking at time. And so it's a 24-hour period here. We got 12 all the way on the left-hand side. Um, this would be 12 noon, 15 um, would be uh, 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Around 18, uh, we see um, a, a, a fluctuation, a, a change in our, um, uh, our graph here. And so what you're seeing here is the percent, if you take a look at the y-axis, the percent time in which the bird is either alert, which is shown by the black space, uh, or the gray bars that extend from the bottom, uh, they exhibit uh, drowsiness. The uh, red bars ex uh, show you um, rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep. This is a relatively active uh, period of sleep in which uh, you are indeed uh, sleeping, but your brain waves look uh, more similar to a conscious brain than they do to a sleeping brain. Uh, and then the blue are, are slow wave, what they call slow wave sleep, or what I described before, neurons all firing together. Um, and so you can see there's no surprise here. When do we see this slow wave sleep? Right, This is the EEG data. Well, from about uh, 1800 hours, so that's 6 p.m., up to you know, about 5 a.m. in uh, 6 a.m. seems to be the hard cutoff. It's, it, it uh, really goes down before it gets to 6, 6 a.m. A lot of blue. So a lot of sleeping is going on here. And if you just kind of draw a, a average line across the top uh, of, of all those blue peaks, we're kind of like at, you know, 70 to 75% slow wave sleep. If you add in the REM there, we're, you know, 75 to 80% of the time between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., the bird's asleep about 80% of the time. Uh, and they're active a little bit um, throughout the night, you know, about 15% of the time the bird's active at night. Um, uh, so this is what you would expect from any kind of diurnal animal, right? They're sleeping at night, uh, and they're active. The black portion 
um, they're active during the day. And they go through bouts of rest, which is the gray, during the day, but they're not sleeping. There's no slow wave activity in the brain going on. Uh, let's take a look here what happens during, and what I've shown you here is uh, uh, these white crowned sparrows during non-migration. So they're not migrating, but during the migratory season, right? So this is during migration. Uh, these birds are uh, in captivity. And what do we see during during their migratory um, behavior? Well, we already know. I already described. They they exhibit zugenrui. They exhibit restlessness at night. So we would expect the black to extend during the night period, and indeed it does. Uh, we can see at the very beginning of the night. Uh, pretty similar. So they do sleep about 6 a.m., I'm sorry, 6 p.m. Um, to uh, just before midnight, uh, but it starts to trail off um, as the night progresses. And by midnight, they're just they're just hardly sleeping at all anymore. And they're extremely active. You can see the how far down the black extends here. You know, it's about 75% of the time, 70, 75% of the time. This is all Zugan really right here that's that's going on here um, so it's clear um, that these birds um, aren't sleeping um, and they just simply don't sleep as much during migration here's another look here um, of uh, a zuganuri uh, during uh, migration this is a video here of the actual uh, bird exhibiting uh, the behavior um, and hopefully it's plain for you. Um, we can see the bird flapping a lot and bouncing back and forth, uh, turning directions on the uh, on the perch. This is the middle of the night. Uh, and what we can see here on the right-hand side is what's called an actogram, something for measuring um, activity uh, over a 24-hour period. And so each, if you take a look at the y-axis, it's the dates, uh, July 15th at the top, all the way down to September 15th. Uh, and as you go across from left to right, uh, this is made up of each individual row is a different day. And so at the very top, that first row is July 15th. The yellow is the day, the blue is the night, and the day again. So this is 24 hour period, probably starting at noon. Uh, and then right there where it turns blue, that's probably 6 p.m. or about, uh, all the way going to the end of blue, which is 6 a.m. Uh, and then the yellow portion on the right is morning, is the morning. And so a 24-hour period. So you can see July 15th, um, well, I should say the little black marks are uh, the bird, when the bird is active. So there's probably um, a, a perch in the cage or perhaps uh, some invisible laser beams uh, in which whenever the bird uh, hops on the perch or breaks the laser beam, uh, it records that, and we infer that the bird is active if those things are occurring in the cage. And whenever there's a little black mark, um, it, there was activity in the cage. So you can see on July 15th, when it gets to the blue portion, there are, there are hardly any black marks, a little bit right before sunrise, right before the end of the night. Um, but there aren't any black marks, so this is obviously the bird is still, the bird is uh, sleeping. Um, but shoot on down here towards... Uh, uh, you know, after the first week of August, we start to see a little bit more activity from the, from the middle of the night into the morning. And by the time we get to middle of August and certainly the first of September, they're just active throughout the entire night. Uh, and so these birds, this is just another example, uh, visualizing the data in a, in a different way, uh, not taking a look at the EEG of the brain activity, but looking at the actual uh, activity of the of the bird itself, the whole organism, uh, we can see they're active throughout the entire night. So they go through this dramatic shift from migration in which they just simply don't sleep or don't sleep very much at all. Okay, now here's, uh, so we can see the video here of the bird going back and forth, flapping its wings. And so this is an example of, of uh, that Zuganrui behavior. So this is likely, you know, midnight. This could be in the middle of the night. Um, which you can tell that they're, um, the fact that it's uh, visualized in green, it's using a night vision um, um, a camera. So the bird is likely in uh, near 
uh, or possibly complete darkness uh, in the night vision is, is using a special uh, infrared light that it can um, detect and then transform into a visible spectrum so we can see it on the video. Uh, but the bird doesn't see anything itself. Uh, now I'm going to show you this video here of uh, the map of the continental United States. Uh, and what you're going to see here is um, our, um, the national uh, radar network that is used for tracking weather, uh, the, the national weather system. Uh, and you'll be able to tell that the, the radar because you're going to see a lot of, you can already see sort of in the, the, uh, the west there, the southern midwest, uh, the little circles of blue. And so each circle is like a radar station because the way that radar works, it, uh, it sends out uh, uh, these uh, uh, waves in, in sort of like a radius, and it, it kind of cycles through, cycles around like a clock. Uh, and what it's going to show us here is it's going to show us the migratory bird activity. All right, and so if we take a look at the timestamp, we're looking at October 2008. Um, and, and so we're going to see this uh, um, um, at nighttime. Um, we're going to see this uh, emergence. And so this radar system, because birds fly uh, during migration at relatively high uh, altitudes, it's going to detect the movement of birds. So you're going to see, um, especially the east coast here in the central U.S., the the radar system just light up, and it's picking up all these individual birds as they move across. So let's take a look here. Here we go. So it's 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Not much is happening. Here we go. Wow, there it goes. There are the birds. So you can see. Everything is lighting up with movement here. And very interesting, you can see how it moved from the east coast to the left to um, the central United States. We don't have as much of the radar systems out west. Um, but it, that was tracking like sunset, right? Uh, and then it disappears uh, from the east coast first as, as uh, morning comes. Uh, so again, just a huge explosion of bird migratory ac activity just at night. And we can see this reflected on our national radar system. Uh, now, this circanual rhythm is very interesting and something that biologists and ornithologists have studied for uh, quite some time, many, many decades. Uh, and it appears to be an endogenous rhythm. And so what do I mean by endogenous? Uh, this is having an internal cause or origin. And so this means it has that this rhythm or this clock, if you will, this circannual clock, is something that this mechanism resides inside the organism um, and it's innate. And so you might think like, well, what could be responsible for the circannual rhythm? Um, perhaps birds are just um, noticing when the weather changes or things are getting warmer. Um, or perhaps the, maybe it's the day length, which I've mentioned in class before, and ultimately day length is the thing that runs circadial rhythm, but maybe they just are noticing that things are getting uh, brighter for longer. Uh, and then they just go, um, and it's externally triggered, right? So it's not endogenous, but it's exogenous. It's uh, from the environment. And so you could easily test this, right, in an experiment, uh, which scientists uh, have done studying the circadian rhythm and also the circannual rhythm, which is the 24-hour rhythm. Uh, if it's if it were exogenous, then you could take birds in to an artificial setting um, and just expose them, uh, uh, prevent them from any exposure to the environment, so they don't know if the day length is changing and they don't know if the temperature is changing. Just put them in a laboratory and indoor aviary. Uh, and just have constant day light cycle, have constant temperature, have constant precipitation, have constant food availability, um, and the circadian rhythm should disappear uh, if it was environmentally triggered. But what we find is that that's not the case. You keep them in constant conditions inside, birds still grow through physiological and behavioral changes, preparing themselves for migration. And so without any external cues letting them know, it must be something from within. 
something endogenous. So let me show you some of the early experiments that showed us that this was the case. Here we're taking a look at captive European starlings under constant day length conditions. So they're in the laboratory and they're under what's known as 1212LD. That stands for 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness in a climate controlled laboratory. So uh, they have no external cues. They, they shouldn't know what time of year it is um, from external cues. Right? So if they, if they go through any sort of behavioral physiological change uh, on a circannual cycle, it must be something pre-programmed. It must be something innate. Uh, and what we see here is that these starlings still exhibit physiological changes associated with migration. And so what we're taking a look here um, are the uh, patterns of molt. Um, and we're also taking a look here at testicular width, so the size of the testes. I've mentioned before in class, um, uh, not formally in a lecture, but I have mentioned a few times that migratory birds, their gonads, both males and females, uh, they regress. They essentially shrink when they're not gonna, when they're not used. So during the non-breeding season, during migration, and during the non-breeding season, uh, and they uh, grow again. Uh, leading up to the breeding season. Uh, and so this is thought to, to have evolved because it was beneficial for flight and for migration, which is, as, as we all know now, is a very arduous task, very uh, physiological, physically, metabolically demanding task. Uh, and so uh, let's take a look at both of these here and let's make sure we uh, understand our graph here. Along the x-axis, we have time and years uh, and so we have one, two, three, and four. So we're taking a look at a four-year span. Um, and our x-axis, we're taking a look here. You can see the x-axis is st st testicular width in millimeters, ranging from a zero to ten millimeters. So still, testes are pretty small, but those small uh, testes uh, will increase in size by nearly an order of magnitude more. So from about two or half of an order of magnitude, about two millimeters at its smallest, up to 10 at its largest. So, you know, five times as big. Uh, and then the black bars are periods in which they are molting, in which they are sh losing their feathers and regrowing new ones. Uh, and you might notice there are four different rows here. These are four different individual starlings, okay? And so what do we see when we keep them in constant captivity for four years? four years, uh, well, we see that they exhibit this about average, or on average, ab about a 12-month cycle of testes regression and regrowth. So you can see for this first one here, um, it goes down, it stays down until year two starts. Uh, and so if we're going from January, it's probably from January to January here. Um, it starts large, the testes uh, shrink, uh, they regrow again, they shrink again uh, near the tail end of year two, um, spanning into year three, year three, they go up again, they shrink again between year three and year four, they go up again, uh, and obviously the experiment uh, ended here. And you can see for all four of these birds, they go through um, over the course of these not quite four completed years, they go through these three periods of distinct um, um, gonadal regression uh, and then uh, a period of regrowth as well. Uh, and we can also see the same thing happens in molt uh, here, that the birds are still molting about once a year uh, for these four years. Now, it's not perfect. Um, and this is the case with any endogenous rhythm, is that it tends to free run and that these endogenous rhythms are not exactly on an endogenous 12 month cycle. Uh, depending on the species and the individual, it could be more like 12 and a half months or 13 months or 11 months or 10 months. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's still endogenous. It will run indefinitely into the future, though it may be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter.
the three months here. And we can see it's just some of the variation here, those two middle birds here, uh, for their molting, circannual rhythm, uh, seem to have uh, probably a rhythm that's longer than 12 months because they've only progressed to three molts, whereas bird one and bird four uh, get at least start their fourth molt during that fourth year of the study. Uh, so they may be closer uh, to that 12-month cycle. Um, and so this brings up an important point. Not only are these circannual rhythms endogenous, which we've already established, uh, but they're also entrainable, which means that they're capable of being brought into a specific rhythm. Uh, and this indeed is something that is caused by external factors or exogenous cues, uh, something to borrow from the uh, German vernacular, since we already have Zugenrui, uh, we can add a Zeitgeber, or the time giver. So external cues um, can help entrain uh, and train these animals to be right on cue for 12 months. Now let's take a look here in another uh, interesting um, experiment here that shows the power of entrainment. These are captive European starlings again. Um, uh, here we're looking um, uh, at the course, uh, over the course of one year. So these are months starting with June June, July, August, September on the x-axis. And again, we're looking at testicular width um, and the black bars again are molt. And so these uh, European starlings were kept in captivity and they were given an artificial, um, artificial but accurate daylight cycle. So what I mean by that is that the daylight cycle they gave wasn't just fixed. It wasn't just 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness for multiple years, they changed the amount of light that they got to match the amount of light that you would see in a normal year. And so this first individual that we see on the top row, they just gave them the normal 12 month daylight cycle. So longer days, you know, depending on exactly where it was, if, you know, they, if it was in Europe, they might have, uh, you know, in June, they might be getting, um, you know, something like uh, up, upwards of 18 hours of light during the day and only six hours of darkness. Uh, and then the days would start to get shorter again um, uh, as the summer progressed into fall and winter. Uh, and so interesting, what they did was is they just took that natural 12-month cycle of the days getting, days starting short, then getting longer, and then getting short again. And what they did was is they just sped it up they just made it over the course of one year. Um, they made it get made the days get long and short on a faster cycle, so it got long and short. But it did that three times in a twelve month cycle. This is the four month daylight cycle, and so it was still twelve months of just time. But the daylight cycle acted as if as if it were going um, around the sun three times or once every four months. So you got multiple long to short day rhythms. Uh, and they did the, the, the same thing again for one and a half months um, for the bird on the bottom row. Um, and so what would that have been? That would have been eight cycles in a year at one and a half months. So over the course of one and a half months, the bird would have seen that full days getting longer and then days getting shorter. Uh, and then the cycle begins over, and they just did that every six weeks. Uh, and so what we see here is, again, um, sort of the opposite of what we saw before. There's no, like, we've screwed up the endogenous cycle. We've fooled the endogenous cycle, and all we did was change the day length. Um, the day length cycle, to be exact. And so normal starling on the top row and the middle, we're giving them a full year's worth of light change in just four months. And we can see that they're cycling through this testicular regression and regrowth. Um, and it goes through this three times over the course of this experiment, molting two different times. And we do this same experiment with a really rapid one and a half month daylight cycle. And we're getting this clear, very punctuated, rapid, quick growth, regression, growth, regression, growth, regression, growth, regression of the testes. And then molting 
at the appropriate times coinciding with um, the gonadal growth of what you would see in the wild. So pretty profound study here that showed between these two conclusively, it's been repeated multiple times in multiple species, that yes, this is a circanial rhythm that's endogenous, which is pretty amazing, right? There's like, there's something, there's, there's something inside the bird and it knows, you know, it just, it, it just knows when to regrow its testes. It knows when to molt. Um, and the fact that it's entrainable, uh, that you can manipulate it based on just how much day length the bird sees. Uh, and so this rhythm and the entrainable rhythm here is um, both uh, uh, genetically and neuroendocrine, uh, the mechanism or neuroendocrine mechanism. So this right here is fueled through um, or is uh, mediated by uh, the, the brain's um, ability to detect and code light and to transfer that to uh, hormonal encoding uh, through melatonin, uh, which cascades to other hormonal and physiological effects. Um, so our bodies and our bodies have similar mechanisms too, um, in which we we essentially keep track of how much light we're exposed to, um, and how this changes over time through endocrine processes, uh, namely melatonin. Okay. Now, let's uh, stop here, uh, and I'll upload a separate video in which I want to go through a case study, uh, transitioning now away from this circanial rhythm mechanism, a, a case study of um, what we would call a migratory mismatch uh, that we're seeing more and more uh, because of climate change.